Good afternoon. I'm Karen Cater, CEO of Digital Promise, and I'll be your host for today's conversation about education leadership in this time of COVID and what it means for digital learning. Thank you so much for joining us. First of all, if you have questions throughout this conversation, please put them in the Q&A, not in the chat, but in the Q&A. Feel free to chat with each other and share resources, but if you have a question, um, I'll be monitoring the Q&A um, uh, channel. Um, we have a lot, of talk, lot to talk about, um, so we will, uh, your questions are important. So with me today are two top education leaders who I am pleased to introduce. Michael Fullen is an internationally renowned author and researcher on school transformation and systems change. His two most recent books are Nuance, Why Some Leaders Succeed and Others Fail, and The Devil is in the Details. He is the global director of new pedagogies for deep learning. Also joining us today is Dr. Mark Edwards, a highly respected expert in digital transformation. Dr. Edwards has previously served as the superintendent of Mooresville Graded School District in Mooresville, North Carolina, as well as superintendent of Virginia's Henrico County, both places where he led significant and successful digital transformations. Dr. Edwards was national superintendent of the year in 2013 and is the author of Every Child Every Day, a digital conversion model for student achievement. You can read much more about them online. Welcome to you both and hopefully you have your video on and audio on. Welcome, thanks for being with us today. Hello. Um, great. So Mark, let's start with you. So here's this great book, um, The Power of Unstoppable Momentum that you published in 2017 with Michael. So tell us a little bit about the book, what you hope to accomplish, key message, et cetera. Great. Well, thanks, Karen. And it's, it's great to be with you and with Michael. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. You know, it was an honor to work with Michael on Unstoppable Momentum. And the, the book was focused really on what I would call kind of the four C's, a foundation of culture and, and really building on work that, that Michael has done over the years and then work that I've been involved with, then, then collaboration and really moving collaboration to new levels, looking at comprehensive whole system collaboration and then system coherence you know one of the things that i think is is really central to leading school districts and leading change is that coherence then ultimately capacity building and i, I was fascinated with some work with michael that he's done over the years on capacity building and i think you put those four c's together and it does translate to unstoppable momentum and you know, Michael had the opportunity to spend time in Mooresville. He's worked around the world. But one of the things that, that there's just a, a consistency with, and that is a foundation related to culture. Fantastic. So the, the goal I think is on the next slide. Um, so the education goal with COVID-19 is not just to survive, right? Which we all are trying our best to, to get through this but also to end up with something educationally significantly better than was the case in 2019. Anything more to add to that kind of lofty goal? Well, I'll get into some of the goals in a minute with the next slide, because that's going to be our, uh, our strategy to do this. Excellent. So okay, so me, Michael, go ahead. Yes, yep. go ahead. Yeah, let me lead into this. Um, First, the first point to make is in December 2019, let's take that time or any time prior to that for the previous 10 years, the education system was pretty much stalled. I mean, I can give you chapter and verse on the data, but students were increasingly disengaged, only about one in five by the time you get to grade 12. Uh, anxiety went up, teachers were less happy with their job. A whole bunch of things that basically said, here's a system that's not working, it's out of date. So along comes COVID and upends everything, obviously. And uh, first it's a shock as it still is for uh, given uh, that we're still in the midst of it. But it also, uh, and this isn't just a cliche, every time there's a disruption, uh, change is going to happen. It can go either way. It can go for the worst uh, or, it can, uh, or it can do what we call the silver linings. That is, it's an opportunity to pay attention operationally to the things that we felt were uh, uh, we're, we're causing it to be stalled. So this really is a golden opportunity. And I 
honestly think it could go either way. And I, I, I call it the, uh, I used to call it when we first started talking about the uh, challenge of the century. Then I was more in a hurry, so I said the challenge of the generation. And then even more of in a hurry now, I said the challenge of the decade. Uh, now I want to say the challenge of this year. But uh, we both, the good thing is, and I think this is confirmation for me as well, Mark is such a great student of action and cultural change and big change. And we haven't worked together since we finished the book in 2017. But when he contacted me a, a, a month ago, he said, I've got these silver linings uh, of, that I think are, we can leverage for change in the systems. And I said, well, lo and behold, that's what we're working on too. And our silver linings are pretty much coincidental. That is, they, they, they say, say the same things. Spirit connections, that's uh, that cluster, I call it the humanity cluster, meaning, purpose, belonging, connectedness, contribution, trust and faith is the students and they're changing their education towards greater meaning. Equity, which has been galloping as inequity for 30 years, but increasingly so. This is the opportunity to really do something about that instead of giving lip service to it. There's a whole open part of uh, personalization and relevance that can be part of this. Uh, what Mark and I call the science of collaboration. Collaboration has been around for 50 years, studied that way, but we never became uh, what I, we call the capacity, the science, the careful doing about what are the characteristics of that. And then uh, public education is on the line right now, and, uh, and it could go either way, and, and a sense of urgency. So these, there are a couple of others you could add, and I'm gonna ask Mark to comment on them as well, but what he and I are really currently excited uh, about is we were both going down the silver linings path the last 12 months or the last six months. And now we wanna converge and really leverage this. We're doing that, I'll give you a couple of examples later. We're doing that in our own new pedagogies for deep learning. But this is an absolutely very clear golden opportunity that could go either way. It could go down the tubes or we could rise to the occasion. This is about rising to the occasion. Excellent. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, Michael, and you know, I, I think that it, the, the time is right for leaders to stand up and to stand tall. And that means that, you know, around the country, around the world, people are struggling. So leadership is more important than ever before. There is a great opportunity in the urgency around this. And I'll, I'll look back, you know, when we talk about equity, and Michael, when we talk about, you know, years and years and years of trying to deal with this, and yet, uh, a few weeks ago, Shelby County was on a Digital Promise web webinar, mm -hmm. and I was talking to their superintendent this morning, George Ray, and they've now deployed 94% of their students all have digital devices. 100% before they finish in the next few weeks will have connectivity. And that is, is, is really groundbreaking. So there are op opportunities that districts are taking advantage of. And I also believe this. I think that public education is, is the foundation of democracy. I really believe that. And I think that preserving it and lifting it up is important. And, and we should look at it with a lens of nurturance, love and nurturance, so that our children will continue to prosper. But the timing's right. The opportunity is here. There are huge challenges and, 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 and a, lot of, a lot of things we just don't understand yet. But if we hold hands and work together, I believe we can, can come out on the better end of this. Okay, that is a great set of silver linings. And we can circle back and talk more deeply about some of these and kind of the practical implications and how we actually make sure that we're focused on relevance, personalization, collaboration, um, and kind of leveraging this, this sense of urgency right now. Uh, Michael, I love what you said about it's, it's, today's, it's today's challenge. Like right now, we have to really look at what we're doing and see if we can uh, make things better. Um, so maybe if we look at the next slide, then there are kind of some key ideas that characterize your work. Um, and Mark, you wanna, you wanna start with that? And then Michael, please add whenever and whatever you'd like to add. Sure, thanks, Karen. And you know, one of the, I think it's real important for districts, school leaders, principals, to make sure that there's clarity about the vision of, you know, our goal in, in terms of improving learning and improving teaching, and ultimately to leverage all of the, all of the conditions today to improve, but it's important to have that clarity with that vision, a, a sense of understanding, and then again, leadership. I think it is so important to understand that leadership is not just about superintendents or principals, 
but it's about everyone and teachers today are demonstrating leadership at levels we've never seen before all over this country. Mm -hmm. Maintenance workers, custodians, other, other members of a school team are stepping up and leading. And I think it's important to have that big vision. And then one of the things that I love, and I'm gonna, I, wanna, I wanna flip this over to Michael, is about accountability. Because uh, one of the things today, we have an opportunity to leverage all, all of the things that are going on to say, we will stand up, we will be accountable. And that, that means transparency about what's going on, listening to the variety of publics, but embracing it. And then I, I think I've learned more about school culture from Michael Fullen than anyone that I know. And, and I think he's, he understands, but Michael, I just, again, I think culture is the foundation of everything that's happening and everything that will happen. Yeah, well, the, uh, this is to put this into perspective and I want to uh, comment on the slide you just had as well. Actually go back to the previous slide, please. Yeah, I just Thank want you. to comment on this. This was the version in 2017 that we wrote about. And this is still relevant, obviously, today, but it was playing itself out in a different environment. And you can see the, the impact of it. Mooresville itself, uh, we document in the book, unbelievable impact where students, not just teachers, but students, were actually able to explain uh, what they were learning and why they were going uh, so deep and all of those things. It was uh, something to behold. So that, um, that the, the question now is what is the 2020, 2021 version of this, which is what we're gonna to turn to uh, in a minute. Uh, but I wanna say also about technology. Um, I had, uh, when I did this paper 2011 on uh, choosing the wrong drivers for system reform, I had technology as a wrong driver, ma mainly because as a driver, it's not going to actually do the driving except, but it is an accelerator. It is a deepener. In fact, it's more than that now because it's better. And we did a report with Microsoft a couple of months ago called Education Reimagine that spelled some of this out. So my point is this, is that uh, when, when Mark discovered and his team discovered culture as the driver, they made technology work for them in an amazing way. Now I want to say, we want to say, that the silver linings are the driver. Technology is the enabler, the accelerator, the deepener, but it's the silver linings that have to be an integrated driver. And that's where we're heading. Mark and I will work on this together uh, uh, after this program, I'm gonna say, uh, because uh, we just teamed up again and we're going to go to town on this as a lot of other people are. And uh, I'll give you an example in a moment of how we started on this in, anyways. Well, just to say a little bit more about digital, it's interesting. The um, you know it, it, we've we've for years and years and years have been continuously having to make the case for why technology, why you know how does it help, you know what is the what's the vision, and is it the driver or is it an accelerator, or is it a support? Um, and now it's it's flipped very quickly in a matter of months to not being about why. Now everybody sees that if students don't have technology, they actually can't join in. They can't learn in their school. They can't, you know, they can't connect with their with their their classmates or their teacher. And so it is now an absolute necessity that everybody has that technology. So now it's not a matter of of why and should we do this, but really how do we do this best? Um, uh, Mark, do you have any, uh, you, you have been one of the masters of, um, of leveraging technology for learning. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how you think that could be best. And then Michael, I'd also love to hear from you after that, I'll give you a minute to think about it, the, um, the vision for deep learning and what, how that plays out in, in this yeah. time. But um, Mark, anything to add about, about digital learning and kind of the how we make this work best for our students and teachers? Well, you know, I think it's important to, to look at the whole digital platform as a platform of opportunity and a platform of opportunity for students and staff. Part of the work that I think will take place in the next months and, and years around using these resources in, in a full way will result in students and teachers discovering new connections they never had before. And it will expand their understanding of what, what their life is about. I really, I, I like the thinking of relevance forward. And I think that, I think students, students demand relevance. Now they may be in attendance, but they're not tuned in unless it's relevant. 
digital tools are about the world that students live in. And then you, you tie that into connecting and building relationships and building new learning. Then you get this sense of, wow, this is about us. And I think that we will see progress made related around the collaborative science and collaborative learning that will be remarkable. But I do think it takes a, a determination and a connectivity. But I also, to me, this is the most exciting part about it is thinking of all the children in this country that have not, in other countries, that have not had opportunities to connect and have not had opportunities in their homes. Now they can and they will and they should. And Karen, as you said, it's not, it's not a question of, is this needed? It's an absolute necessity. But that opportunity is something that we should leverage and we should use. And I think communities will rally around all the hardships related to remote learning, but say we're connecting, we can do this, and we will make a difference for every child. That's, I love that. And, and, and um, yeah, I love that. The other thing I think that's really interesting with, with, um, with this technology that we're putting in kids' hands is it's also somehow working towards creating a sense of agency. Students are by necessity having to help themselves and have, having to find things, find ways of, of supporting their own learning. So perhaps over time, that's a bit of a, a silver lining as well. But as we think about the pedagogy, um, how technology can support new pedagogies, um, Michael, you also are the kind of the, the, one of the foremost experts on this notion of deep learning or deeper learning. Um, so when you think about the vision for, um, you know, with unstoppable momentum and the vision, how, how do you think about the vision for uh, deep learning? Okay, so let's go to the next slide and we'll uh, use that just as a kind of a context for this. Uh, first, in terms of technology, uh, we and others have moved from being a bit skeptical, uh, say 2011, when I was worried about, because a lot of people, Mark knows this as well, they were trying to buy their way into the future by investing in technology, but not thinking about pedagogy. But there's no question now that uh, equity is, first of all, tied up with uh, having a device, having accessibility, having a, uh, being able to use a platform. And, uh, and now, and I think we, we actually use this term in our report in May, that uh, technology has become elevated to a major player at causing change, not just being a reinforcer. So we like the fact that technology can liberate that because I think it's more of a liberator now than it has ever been. So having said that, we did in 2015 uh, establish an initiative called New Pedagogies for Deep Learning, uh, which is, it can be accessed npdl.global. So npdl.global, you'll see videos and all kinds of things. And I wanna give you a concrete example in a moment, but just to set it up, we tried to, we wanted to do deep change, we wanted to do system change, and, and we really weren't wanting to go for the whole thing. But we also wanted a model that was uh, uh, concise, comprehensive, uh, parsimonious, something that doesn't require you to study at, for a week before you can do it. So it's very simple in some ways, but very powerful. Its foundation is the six C's of what we call the global competencies. Uh, so character and uh, citizenship and collaboration and communication and creativity and critical thinking. Uh, most of those have been around for a while, but they haven't been put together. We have uh, defined those. We've uh, created rubrics to, to guide teaching with them and progressions of uh, depth of uh, in, in doing that. So that's the kind of center. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually gonna say something that's a little bit uh, pushy in one way because uh, I wish we had more time in one way because I can say that the, the extreme emphasis on academic progression, academics, is not the motivator that most students uh, think about initially. It's one you mentioned, Karen, which is purpose, meaning, belongingness, making a contribution. All of those academics can help, but that's not the main point. The main point is to be someone in the world that's learning and making a difference. So in this, then we have, that's why we focus on the six C's. We then have uh, just four pillars of pedagogy. Pedagogy itself, partnerships with parents and uh, students and teachers is the second one changing the learning environment so it's more conducive. And the third one is leveraging digital, very spelling out how it's a big player in this. So those six plus four, and then the system to do that. So we have a, a, a two books. One is called Deep, uh, Deep Learning, Engage the World, Change the World. And the other the, is called uh, Dive into Deep Learning, Tools for Engagement. So these are the tons of examples, video and otherwise, but I just wanna give you one 
and a footnote for another one. We just started, although we've been cultivating in the last 12 months, to uh, transform the entire province of uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, which is the easternmost province of Canada. And it had only one, it has only one district because it's, uh, it's spread out, it's all over the place. 255 schools in the district, four regions, incredible diversity of geography and ac access to getting at things, if you think of it that way, the uh, uh, you know, fishing villages and all kinds of disparity. So uh, we, they have, we planned with them, and it's very important when you do this work that the school districts or the system is the partner in co-determining how to do it. We can have the frame, but we need them to develop that. And so we had a two-day event last week, and it's phenomenal. It's got all, uh, all 255 school principals, uh, uh, the regions, the four regions, the government. Uh, we've used our system knowledge to partnership at the three levels, the, the center, which is the Ministry of Education, uh, the middle, which are the four regions and the individual schools. So you'll be able to see things and you can probably go to their website to see it. They are committed and we're committed to linking well-being and learning, not just learning, integrating the two. Uh, we call it uh, uh, that, you know, getting good at, uh, getting good at learning and good at life. And I'm, I'm just going to say, pay attention to that because we'll be reporting on it. They'll be reporting on it. And they're, they're going to produce this because we really have almost 100%, I'm going to say, of the local leaders who are beavering away to implement this with us. And the sy system is trying to mean it, uh, support it. So there, there's a really, uh, this is, I'd say it this way, 80% of our best ideas come from leading practitioners. And we see this again in Newfoundland Labrador. We also have, and I, won't, I could name some others, and we've got eight countries, but I'll take one more in the US. Uh, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana has 50 schools in this district. A uh, year or so ago, uh, when they started with us, they, we said, oh, you gonna, do you wanna start with 10 schools? They said, hell no, we're going to go, we, we, want, we wanna change the system. And so uh, this, uh, this is one where Wendy Robinson, the superintendent who just stepped down, fantastic leader. And we are now uh, remotely doing uh, sessions with leaders, uh, uh, hundreds of, of uh, principals and teachers in Fort Wayne, where they're implementing using the best of what's coming out of COVID opportunity, but applying it with this framework. I could go on, you can see it in our website, uh, but this is the answer. The answer is not trying to get more advanced placement courses under your belt, or, or even to have high school graduation as a goal in itself. It's not an end in itself. Students and others stop with this. We have discovered, and you, you alluded to it, Karen, that students intrinsically want to make a difference and want to be involved in something meaningful. And it's not, the students that are turned off, it's not because they're unmotivated. It's because they're not motivated by what's happening to them in that classroom in these days. And once you motivate them, this is also the key to the equity problem because all kinds of the students who are, uh, are disconnected and, and have problems in equity. They have huge potential, real life experiences that they can be put, that we've seen them be put into place. So I'm excited by the multifaceted opportunity of implementing deep learning. We do have to figure out how to do something about the outcome measures of learning. Literacy and numeracy, high school graduation are not sufficient. We have to measure and which we're doing, the six C's. We've got to change the pedagogy pretty remarkably, but this is the silver lining to jump on this opportunity and these sets of things that I'm just referring to. And we know them because we've seen them happen under more difficult circumstances where the system wasn't supporting it. Now, if we can mobilize the uh, silver linings as Mark and I will do with some school systems in the next 24 months, we'll see changes and we'll see changes that have a uh, contagion effect, a positive contagion effect in this case. That's fantastic. Um, Mark, any other, any kind of further comments or examples? Um, well, just I, I would, would add on to Michael's thought about, again, students being the center of the action, mm -hmm. really looking at it from the student's view constantly and connecting with them. And students, you know, one of the things that we've learned, students' voice matters every day, not occasionally, not advisory, but as they talk about their work. And when students, I love hearing when students talk about their work, my work, what I'm doing, what I'm about. And, it's, and, I, and I do think the whole idea of 
of getting better at life, that's far more important for students than getting better at a test. So when you think about getting better at life and its connections, but I would also say this, it is so important that we understand that in, on, when we talk about silver linings, this is an opportunity for us to work together and to build that sense. So I do think that the, the, the potential, the deep learning, the opportunities, and, and this is the time to, to stand up and take action. That's excellent. There was another um, piece I heard um, uh, Michael refer to, and that's this notion of Im the importance of partnerships and communication with families, with students and families. And this, this is a silver lining. I mean, people are so much more connected to families. They have to be because families are supporting their child's learning, you know, at home as they are, as they're getting, you know, entering in this new school year, in many, many cases, they're still, still working at home. Um, so I think, you know, I think, in, I think it's in Phoenix where they have a, a system where every, they make sure that every single student and family gets a 15 minute minimum phone call every single week. So if you divide and conquer, is if every teacher or every administrator makes sure that happens for their families, um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a super helpful connection. Um, any, any thoughts on other ways of, of connecting with families and, uh, and, well, and I just, yeah, I want to underscore your point, uh, Karen, because when we started, I started in system, uh, system change and implementation in around 1970, ages ago. So, uh, collaboration was then our big, uh, feature capacity yeah. building was our language, but we treated, uh, parents in the community as recipients of good schools, not as participants in good schools. Even, you know, so when you look at my work on those, uh, you don't see as much emphasis on the active role of communities. Uh, but what has changed even before COVID, gradually, and then with more acceleration, I'm gonna say in 2018, 2019, you began to see the role of families as part of the solution because the system was failing and they were gonna fail more if they couldn't connect to families. Now, what COVID has done is exactly what you said, it's catapulted families into proactive uh, members of uh, this phenomenon and trying to sort it out. So what you need if you're a school district is a strategy that's proactively dealing with the key role of parents, not only just in the, not only in the stopgap problem of dealing with the disruption, but the carryover problem of changing the system fundamentally into the, into the silver linings we talked about. So this, the change potential here is fantastic because you have students as change makers. Mm -hmm. who, who, uh, who's gonna love that? Parents are gonna love it. You have students as change makers, you have parents are already engaged in this kind of learning, already probably appreciating the school a lot more than they did before they had to try to cope with their kids. So but five and seven year old kids for all day long. Uh, so there's a, re a real kind of, a, we're in this together feeling that's potentially emerging. If we can latch on to that, the strategies that take this into actual fulfillment and impact with parents as being essential for that, we will have a big victory. And Karen, I'll, I'll jump in there. You know, I, I think that one of the, when we talk about the community and families, communication uh, so often uh, when I was a superintendent, with good intentions, a lot of our communication was one way, which really wasn't communication. It was, Michael, it was like, we're gonna let you know what's going on. But I think understanding the importance of listening and uh, demonstrating that deliberately, intentionally with parents and students to say, we need to listen, and then having conversations about what we're hearing. You know, one of the things that I think is so important is to understand that as families are dealing with all types of stressors, they need a lot of love and attention. And I think that as we approach this work and understand that the work that has to be done is about education, but it is about well-being. You know, Michael, like you were saying, it's about well-being. We have to understand that families and members, and as, as frustrations arise, now this is one of the things, frustrations are gonna arise every day. Teachers are gonna say the, the connections aren't working. Uh, th this is not, this part of the constant need there is it's gonna be okay, nurturance, we'll work together, let's hold hands. A lot of, of old, you know, let's, let's hold hands and stick together but it's important that active listening, active communication. Karen, I love the idea. I saw, I read something about the, uh, the school district in, in, in Phoenix with that communication. 
deliver, focusing on constant communication. And I also believe this. I know years ago in Mooresville, we had a, our, our entire, all of our systems went down. And we were, we didn't have textbooks. We were relying on technology. And, but what we did is we reported out all the problems. And we said, this is what's going on. This is, yes, we know it's, and, but by communicating. And we communicated with the media and then they communicated and said, we know what the problem is. But I think by going ahead and putting it on the table, people said, okay, we're, we'll, we'll stick with it. So I think it's a lot of transparency is essential in this type of environment. Yeah, clarity, clarity, clarity. And I love that the two way is, is critical. I think um, we had uh, Superintendent uh, Rob Runcie from Broward County on earlier this series. Um, and he talked about doing a survey with their, with their communities to find, this was back in June, to find out what they wanted, what they were hoping for um, with their schools in this situation. And they had, I think, 65,000 responses. So people, are engaged they are paying attention it, it you know i don't know if we'll get back to where people just happily send their kids off to school and you know say good luck and i'll see you at the end of the day but um you know i think we definitely have a situation where people are understanding uh mm -hmm. learning they're understanding their own children they're seeing what teachers uh do and and contend with um, any uh, sort of, and for the participants, by the way, if you have a question, please put them in the Q&A and I will monitor that and, and uh, we will we'll try to get to your questions. So please, um, please ask questions of this, uh, this expert, these experts. Um, so many of the participants are school principals and I'm curious, um, do you have any sort of practical, I mean, there, there actually has been much practical advice already, but any kind of practical tips or tricks or advice that you would give uh, principals as they're kind of entering into this new school year? Well, on the practical side, uh, there's, there's quite a few pieces coming out now that give uh, specific uh, practical guidelines, and you've given a couple of examples yourself. And we have uh, in Appendix 1 of our Education Reimagine report, we have eight categories with a 114 pieces of advice about how to deal with the practicalities. So with the way I see it now is, um, is first, one thing, people are pretty tolerant that it's not smooth. I mean, they, 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 they feel the, the lack of smoothness in their lives all, all over the time. So I, I think people have a degree of empathy that there's no leader that's going to be able to smoothly run this. So I feel there's a degree of mutual empathy out there now. And then secondly, if, uh, and our advice to this is deal with the practicalities, worry about well-being, and uh, don't be, don't, you know, don't go crazy over learning, set up the basis of it. But uh, let me put it this way, that you can make up for three months of lost learning a lot faster than you can make up of three months of lost well-being. Yeah. And so I think the acceleration possibilities of what we call the uh, silver linings, acceleration of learning, because we've seen learning accelerate like crazy, we can make up for a lot of learning. So I'm, I'm, my practical advice is hold it together between now and January, let's say, for starters. Uh, do, do the things we're talking about. And then keep building towards the opportunity that you're going to be able to leverage some acceleration. It may not, be, it certainly won't be September, but it could be January, February. And uh, that's where you're headed. That's where you should head. So don't beat yourself up over not being able to get there fast enough hold out the promise by setting up the conditions that when you are in a position to do more, it will actually move fast. And focusing on well-being so, so critical. Mark, what are some of your practical pieces of advice for principals? Sure. Well, you know, um, a principal that is engaged with the community, is in, engaged with, with everyone involved around the life of a school becomes, it, it's really important in terms of faith. People want to know we can do this. So I think it's important to to say we're going to hit some bumps. And that means with faculty, with students, with parents, we'll hit bumps, but we'll work through it. So there's a sense of it's practical, not, not to predict doom, but to predict it's going to be uncomfortable. But it's something that I think it, that principles that, you know, when and before COVID, you could do a lot of this in person. Now you can't, but you can still get the job done. And that one is with brand new teachers coming into schools all over this country. Now, in one way, they're more, uh, they're more prepared to deal with this probably than a lot of veterans in that their expectations are kind of wide open. 
but that, that sense of, okay, let's give them a firm foundation. Let's do everything we can. The other, on the other end of it, when we have teachers that are, you know, 55, 65 years old, they've dedicated their lives to working and they're struggling. It's not a time to say, well, you, that, sorry. No, it's a time to say, we'll, we'll get through this. And, and great principles pair learning they, they work through those collaborative pieces so that people are working through things together. So setting the tone that you're not alone. You're never alone. We're, we're together. We're in this together. And I think, you know, Michael said earlier, you know, there's a sense that we're in this together. Well, that doesn't happen very often. So if we take advantage of that, but I would also say this, every principal in this, I hope every day that they say thank you to teachers, thank you, they lift up students, and when they see good things happening every day, they should lift it up and take notice so that look at this great work going on in this school, or look what this custodian, and it's important. I would also say this, principals know this. Even though the schools aren't open, meals are being delivered. Uh, transport, transportation services are still being used to support things. So all those support services are vital, and it's making sure important that they're acknowledged and i really believe that when that acknowledging work being done is more important right now than it has ever been and so if we connect all the people that are lifting children up then we're all going to lift together that's that's excellent and actually one of the questions in the q a kind of is it's close to what you were just saying basically school and learning has become transparent in so many ways um, and many teachers are experiencing vulnerability. They're, they're, it's, they're exposed. Parents are watching them on Zoom meetings. They're, they're seeing how they interact with their students. They're seeing how they solve problems, um, seeing how they uh, respond to things. Um, how can we, are there other ideas for best caring for teachers who are perfectionists? I mean, Mark, you talk about the, the teachers who, you know, making sure we point out the great things people are doing, but how do we also um, represent and uh, recognize and maybe even um, celebrate the, the challenges and how we're approaching challenges? Ideas on that? Maybe Michael, you have any ideas on that? Well, in accountability, first to approach it that way, we have um, redefined what we call a culture of accountability away from the version that has dominated in systems for the last 20 years. Uh, uh, so accountability, we now know, Richard Elmore said this in 2004, no amount of external accountability will be effective in the absence of internal accountability. So we have built uh, the cultures that Mark talks about and implements are highly accountable, but they don't feel punitive because they're based on non-judgmentalism, on specificity, on transparency, on supporting each other, on having an attitude that this won't work, but we can make it work. And there's, and the, the, the co-development of this is really important. Uh, so I think that getting that uh, atmosphere, and people now know in COVID that no amount of, uh, of traditional accountability can be workable. So at least that gives us a chance to build up the internal accountability that we talk about. But you mentioned teachers, and I, I must say I don't have a good uh, kind of summary of this, but I think teachers who are uptight with perfection are, are really in trouble these days because uh, the, 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 what already wasn't a perfect world, but this is ridiculous now. And we all know that the best way to learn is to uh, relax on your perfection, have high standards, but know that you know it's the growth mindset kind of mentality. And so I think on the two extremes, the highly perfection-oriented teacher and the laissez-faire teacher are both in trouble. We've got to have teachers who are <clears throat> um, going to be able to cope, and I think Mark reuses the phrase, the, uh, the science of collaboration. The mm -hmm. collaboration we're doing now is imbued with efficacy, the characteristics of efficacy, high expectations, going for the best strategies, sharing the best ideas, leaders participating as learners. I mean, school principals now, school principals mm -hmm. participating as learners with teachers moving the school forward. Those are all, uh, the, that's all the new science of, uh, of collaboration that Andy Hargraves writes about. We do and adapt now in California. A lot of us have operationalized collaboration in highly precise ways, precision over prescription. Excellent, that is all really helpful. 
Um, you know, there's, a, there's one other question uh, that one of our, our uh, participants has asking about, um, as, as some people are characterizing virtual learning as a less satisfactory experience compared to in-person <laughs> learning, or they're kind of looking at, the, at both of those, um, how are you thinking about um, uh, ensuring that the best of digital learning actually survives um, and grows in the eye of the public rather than, and, and actually I think part of it is not conflating the two. Virtual learning is not the same as digital learning. Digital learning, there are lots of benefits to that. Virtual learning is this notion that you're online like we are right now. Mm -hmm. um, but any other any other thoughts on that and how we sort of communicate to the public what's happening now and how to how to capture those silver linings specifically about digital learning? I think it's, you know, Karen, I think it's really important to connect uh, around, again, around collaborate, connect teachers to best practices and also yeah. students to the best learning. You know, a, a long, boring lecture online is just as bad as a long, boring lecture in person. Yeah. So, you know, you can, you can duplicate uh, it, things that don't work, but I think it's important, you know, students like to learn uh, in fractals. Pops here and it pops there and it connects and, you know, as students see best practices with great digital content, and by the way, there's phenomenal digital content available that is so exciting. My son was, he's at uh, Appalachian State University. He was talking about a virtual tour the other day. And he said, you know, I've seen some real, some virtual tours that were okay. This one was really, really cool. And so the experience of that was, it was a big experience. So I think that as students connect, um, and as teachers learn to use this resource, I, I do think it can translate really well. And you know, it's interesting. Think about when students get home, what's the first complaint? Lots of times they're looking at their phone or if students are connecting, what it means is that's their life. So if we can build on how their life works, um, I, think, I think we can translate. And I do think the opportunity is to come out better than we did before. And that will be a remarkable, achievement. I think it's still in the balance, but it would be a remarkable achievement if we can do that. Yeah, I could absolutely. Do, Aaron, if I could say also another practical example, another district we work with is the Ottawa Catholic School Board in Ontario. It has 83 schools, and when they started with us five years ago, they started with seven schools, year one. They added eight, so that was 15. Then the third year, which was 24 months later, they added all 83. And if you go to their website, uh, ocsb.com or whatever, uh, you will see countless examples of uh, virtual learning, remote learning, hybrid learning, all kinds of things that they have generated with the students and te teachers. So uh, now I, I, you know, I used to think that uh, when students were off on their own, they're not going to be learning very much. They're going to be playing games and all of that. But now you see the, with, the, with the deep learning agenda especially, they are off on their own doing incredibly productive and meaningful things. And a lot of it is using remote learning and the role of technology is essential in that. So I think we have a new, uh, a new heroic role for technology that wasn't there before. So um, before we get to kind of a final, like biggest hopes and, uh, and back to the kind of the positive, this is, this is fantastic by the way. Um, in your unstoppable momentum, you do have one circle there that I'm, I'm intrigued with and that's the distractors. Um, and I'm, it probably has to do with how do you avoid getting distracted by the distractors. But can you say a little bit more about that? I'll, I'll mention something because I, I, I do think I, in Michael's book, uh, Six Secrets, uh, and, and again, I would encourage any uh, participants today to go back and look at Six Secrets because I, Michael talks about distractors, but, but uh, the, the typical people on on a faculty or in an organization who say, we can't do this, we can't do it, or, or, they, or they're quick to point out problems, but no solutions. And I think it's really important to, to, to listen to that. Okay, let's talk about solutions. So let's talk about how we can make, get things done. But the distractors of not focusing on the work and getting, running uh, around and not getting the work done it, it, it takes that coherence. It takes that sense of we're focusing on improving conditions. But, but I would also say this, it, that's something that takes work every single day. Sometimes we think, of, oh, there's a distraction. We'll deal with that. Okay, let's move on. 
Yeah. You know, they have to constantly work on building coherence, cohesion, collaboration, and connectivity. And if that's built mm -hmm. into the formula, but I think it's leaders have to stand up and say, let's say focused. And, you know, earlier, you know, Michael was talking about, we've got to keep the focus. And I think that is really important through that distraction to say, let's stay focused. Excellent. Um, so you've alluded a little bit uh, along the way, what's next, but what is, what is next for the two of you? I know you're going to be collaborating. Uh, can you give us a little bit more about what you're, what you're looking at next? Uh, I, well, I, we haven't figured out the mechanism of collaboration or the focus of it, but we do know that there was unfinished business from the 2017 book. We th had the right direction. A lot of the districts actually uh, learned from Louisville, learned their ideas, moved forward in that. But the system, I'm going to say, wasn't conducive to going very far. The system was dragging everybody down until December 2019, I'm going to say. So, uh, so I see now our uh, next work on our, uh, in two ways. So the one with Mark is we will figure out how to combine, work with some districts where the districts sign on and say, we want to use the silver lining strategy in an integrated, focused way, sustained way to bring about changes that include what we call the global competencies as the change in technology, and we're really going to go for it. And then I think those districts, uh, when I think of the three levels, there's lo local communities, districts, and then the state, is that those districts now have to mobilize their communities, but they also have to, I, I predict there's going to be more pressure on the center, that is the state level or the federal level, around testing, around uh, uh, guidance for investment in education around early learning. So I think that we need to put more pressure on the on the on policymakers and find policymakers who are receptive to this direction. And we spelled this out in the book called The Devil. But we're going to team up and do this. We're going to continue to do our deep learning, and I expect some significant breakthroughs uh, in the next 24 months. Fantastic. Scale, scale work. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it, I'm, I'm really excited about it. You know, I've always, I, I believe that the best leaders combine a sense of efficacy and a sense of focus and translate that into uh, the, the, what I would call spirit elements of care and conviction and, and mm -hmm. faith. And I'm not talking about it from a religious context, but from an organizational context. And then teaming that up with this, the science of collaboration, the science of relevance. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really excited about uh, working with Michael on that, working with districts. And, and I, I want to mention this again, I'm working with Shelby County Memphis schools and I was reading a communication from a student who received their first device in their life and received connectivity in their home for the first time. Yeah. And somebody asked this little girl, I think she may have been fifth grade, four, fifth, fifth or fourth said, well, what do you think? And she said, I never knew people cared that much. Ah, I, think, I, yeah. I never knew people cared that much. And, and, I, and I think that, so we have, we, we can leverage equity at a level that can really be huge. So I yeah. think we need to hear that all over the place. I didn't know people cared that much. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's fantastic. And kind of on that note, that definitely gives me hope. But is there one last kind of closing comment that you have? What gives you hope? What we're, you know, what do you see as the most hopeful thing right now? And that actually, Mark, was a, is a great one. Yeah. Well, Thank one you. of the attitudes I have, uh, and I follow evolutionary biologists. Uh, there's a few of them right periodically. And I like E.O. Wilson, who uh, does this analysis where he ba basically, and he's talking about evolution. He said one thing. Uh, system change is uh, relentlessly bottom up. He said, if it ever works, it's because the relentlessly bottom up pays off. And then he says also that some of the breakthroughs are scientific and they're, and by definition, the laws of science means that there's some limits to it. We break the limits a lot, but there's still limits. And then, and then he says a good thing about humans is that fantasies and imagination has no limits. So we've got this unlimited potential as humans and this uh, uh, other side. Now that's, I'm saying it very abstractly, but I, I'm confident that if we bring these together, uh, that, that, that that's going to pay off in a major way. The one um, big doubt, I, I don't think I call it a doubt, but it is a doubt, is, uh, is uh, racism. And, uh, yeah. and because what the reason I'm discouraged, discouraged is for 50 years, we've had policies and money about equity, and they haven't paid off one iota. 
it's probably a, it's partly a societal problem, but it's also an educational problem. So it's not a hope, but it's a, it's a desire to actually make change in racism and disconnectedness uh, because of the nature of the way we go about it differently in the future. That's a big, big silver lining. It's in our list, equity. Yeah. And I think it can, uh, it, uh, it, it's still a hope because I think it's such a, it's, it's such a big problem that's never been solved. But I, and it's a definitely a societal problem, but I think education can shift from being on the receiving end of a bad society, that's the way I put it, to be more proactive about what's our role. And I think deep learning and equity actually go hand in hand. Fantastic. Karen, Mark, just, any last, yeah. Yeah, I'll just add that, you know, my wife's a teacher, she's a media specialist teacher and they're and, and struggling with all of the, the remote learning and, and she's taken on a new role and direct teaching, virtual teaching, and the, the other day, things, everything that could go wrong went wrong. They couldn't connect, having troubles, with just everything. And then ultimately, she made it, I'm going to call each parent up and just say, we're going to work through this. So she started, it took some time, so she started calling. But I asked her later, I said, how, how did that go? And she said, you know, most of the parents said, you can, all I needed to hear was that voice. All I needed to have is somebody call. Yeah. I just needed, so I think it's, yeah. that, that we're, we're going to fuse best practices from, that's an old practice, that communication, but to the future. And I think, you know, when, when people feel that connection, we'll get through this together. Fantastic. That amazing work of teachers at sea, it is um, that resilience, problem solving, you know, we've got to keep them healthy, keep everybody well and, uh, and carry on. Um, Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom. Um, I appreciate both of you so much and I'm sure our participants do as well. Also, thank you to our listeners. This webinar is actually the last in the series on school leadership um, supported by the Wallace Foundation. You will find the recording of this webinar as well as any supporting resources that were mentioned by Michael and, and uh, Mark um, on our website at digitalpromise.org slash webinar. Um, for today, I am Karen Cater signing off. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.